In the lecture two, I will talk about ion optical systems and spectrometers. Now, you have already used ion optical systems. You know how to combine them. You are in the tutorial. You are always having already to do with the system. But so I can go quickly uh, through that. Um, the, in the first lecture, you of course uh, learned uh, several things that are summarized here for your overview. Uh, you have seen the magnetic elements. You know now about the quadrupole. You know already that the singlet is horizontally focused and defocusing. So if you want an, uh, um, an optical analogy, uh, a quadrupole lens would look like this. So it's not a symmetric, but it's uh, focusing and defocusing. And you need uh, a doublet at least uh, to get a, a focus. Otherwise, uh, one dimension always goes uh, to infinity. Um, and uh, a doublet, a triplet would be needed. Uh, and you see here from the calculation, and you have seen that in your <coughs> simulation, uh, for the example, uh, the angle uh, enter here and the angle here is different and of course in the vertical direction here uh, <coughs> different even from that plane so it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, imaging uh, like you would expect in a good optical lens for that you need a triplet you need a triplet with uh, a drift in the beginning drifts between at the end you can run the first and the, the second one uh, at the same current, uh, roughly half of that in this one. Uh, so uh, you need only two, two uh, power supplies because these you can run into series. Uh, but it's of course a, a, a big piece of equipment with quadrupoles and so on. So you're talking about seven meter, even for uh, something like uh, SICAR. So it is um, uh, space, there's a lot of space involved and so on. So ion optics is not, uh, building ion optical things is not, not cheap or uh, even uh, simple. An example of a calculation is here, the beamline triplet just in front of uh, St. George, that I've done some time ago, to see how this uh, runs here symmetric. And uh, the magnification from here to here, angle magnification, is uh, one. And then, of course, uh, you open up the reaction, and here uh, there's a much larger emittance as created by the reaction. You have. So you can't see where you're pointing. Hmm? So we can't see where you're pointing on the side. Oh, oh that's a pity. Good. Can we get that somehow? Do some work on my side. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Laser pointer. You don't see the. Oh, now. Oh, now you oh, got it. Well, that's the me. pointer was visible for just a short. That's me. <laughs> oh, oh, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give me the yeah. mouse? <laughs> Let's see if you have it now. No, it's still you. I don't know how to do that, sorry. Does anybody know? <laughs> I can see it on my screen here, but that doesn't help you. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, maybe I could, while they're trying to figure that problem out, maybe I uh, I continue and uh, try to 
uh, point by explaining what I'm pointing to. You have a question? Do you have a laser pointer? Hmm? A pointer? Yeah, that, that I can do. That is a not visible on the. Okay. That, that is a not visible on the. Oh, sorry. I'm okay. At least it's visible for us. This is at least visible for you, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at some more complex uh, systems like a spectrometer. This Oh, now this died. It's got brand new batteries in it. Is it the battery? Some more, I think. Uh, it shouldn't from dropping, shouldn't it? <laughs> I have another one. Sorry for our technical problems here. Uh, but let me try from yours. There you go. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, here you see my name. <laughs> oh, no, no. Can I have my screen back? Is that you? Yeah. Is that your mouse? This is your mouse. Oh, this yeah, is yeah, yeah, I know. Can you hear the mouse? Yeah. But so it's working now? Yes, but I want to, to make this bigger. Oh. Um, well, but maybe we can work with that. Is it big enough for you in the back rows? That's your mouse. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yay! So, uh, well, the advantage, of course, seeing the mouse on the screen is that it's also on the recorded video. Uh, so that was an attempt to do that, and it looks like it's working now. Okay, uh, so here you see the... Uh, uh, the K600 spectrometer, that was a spectrometer, was decommissioned in 2000 at IUCF, uh, running until then, as high resolution spectrometer. Uh, a copy of it is running now at Ithemba Labs, so if you want to uh, use such an instrument, you still can. Uh, this shows um, uh, uh, two big dipoles to provide a very large dispersion. It has here a quadruple at the beginning, uh, to uh, come uh, nicely through the relatively small gap. It's very expensive to make large magnets with large gaps. If it's unavoidable, you need to do it, but it's expensive. So that is a function of this uh, quadrupole. There's a small hexapole here for higher order corrections. There's also a, a unique uh, feature. This is a hexapole built as pole, uh, as pole tip uh, coils. So it is between, in the dipole gap, there's a hexapole built in. And you see this, uh, if you want, C-shape here again, so the, it drops to both sides. Uh, uh, correspondingly, there's a kinematic coil, K-coil, here, H for hexapole coil, uh, K for kinematic coil, it's like a quadrupole. So there are other ways than the quadrupoles and the hexapole I showed you before uh, that can be built. Um, so this is uh, the ingenuity of uh, Bob Pollock, who designed these magnets at IUCF many years ago. Uh, so otherwise, what you see here are the, uh, are the edges here, focusing, defocusing, uh, and uh, also higher orders built in here from the shape of these uh, uh, dipole entrance and exits. We, uh, I talked about already in length of... Uh, uh, the detector system uh, here. Uh, one particular feature of this is if you change, if you make dipole one and dipole two uh, identical in field, uh, then you are here in the medium dispersion plane, which is uh, here. So you would have your detector not here at the high dispersion plane, but at the low dispersion plane. If you change the ratio of the dipole one and dipole two, you actually get uh, different focal planes with higher dispersion and here lower dispersion. So this spectrometer has built in by changing the dipoles um, the um, different dispersions. Uh, 
uh, of course, if you have larger dispersion, you have a smaller range, etc. So uh, this is, of course, you can all do uh, in uh, ion optics uh, by simulating that. Uh, this here is another spectrometer, uh, many years ago, actually uh, designed with the help of Carl um, uh, Brown, who, uh, uh, who developed this code here. He was there to help and it has some interesting features. First of all, you see it has two quadrupoles for better control at the beginning for better control. It has also two dipoles. It has uh, higher order corrections all over. It is split not only for practical purposes, not to have a huge magnet, but also have more edges uh, to control. So if that would be one magnet, you had only the entrance and the exit edge. Uh, but if you have uh, a split here, like also in the angle split pole, you may have heard, uh, also uh, built to have more control over the higher order corrections. So that is a higher order feature here. Uh, one particular feature here, which I haven't seen in any other magnet, is that this is a quadrupole at the exit. Of course, there you have already dispersion. So if you activate that quadrupole, you change the dispersion. So this has an interesting uh, property. If you have it activated correctly, the um, uh, the uh, uh, the quadrupole three here, uh, then you have high dispersion and small range. So this is like a, a telezoom which you have put in for maximum uh, magnification. If you change now the quadruple three, you see these lines are coming together. The resolution is not as good because the dispersion goes down. D over M over 2X naught is a resolving power, uh, but the range is larger. So depending on if you want a larger range, high resolution, you can zoom in or zoom out. And uh, you see here, the dispersion is almost zero and it can actually be reversed. Uh, this here is a high resolution spectrum uh, with 4 kV and particle spect uh, spectroscopy, uh, very, very high resolution. And now let's come to uh, 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 an interesting, uh, to the first spectrometer, uh, another spectrometer, which is the Grand Ryden high resolution spectrometer. I take that uh, here because we implemented here, the dispersion matching, which is an important ion optic, first order ion optical uh, property of the combination of beamline and spectrometer. Um, so, this spectrometer has uh, also two particles at the beginning a sextopole or hexapole here uh, for higher order correction, a multipole uh, for um, where you can also make flexible corrections, uh, and then two dipoles. Uh, the beam line is shown here. We'll get back to that. Now the problem is if you have a high resolution spectrometer, uh, say um, 10 to minus 4 or close to 10 to minus 5, as in this case of the um, uh, Grand Ryden spectrometer, as this spectrometer at Osaka is called, uh, and you have a cyclotron. Uh, then you have the following problem. If you focus here achromatically, and you know now what achromatically means, it's a small beam spot, it has, it has a, of course, a focus, but no dispersion, no angular dispersion. Uh, then uh, you, the intrinsic uh, uh, energy spread of the beam, you will see in the focal plane here. In the case of uh, the Grand Ride and the cyclotron, the ring cyclotron at uh, Osaka, the resolution of say 200 MeV uh, protons is something like 120 kV. So you would never get a resolution better than 120 kV if you just focus the beam achromatically on target. What you need to do, you need to make the dispersion on target such uh, that you have here one spot. So that is possible. And then you can, with the spectrum, despite the fact that the beam spread is 120 kV, you can get a resolution of 20 kV, which is the limit of the resulting power of the instrument and not a feature of the beam, the poor beam that you have. Now, one other thing you see here, uh, for the same angle here, zero degree, you have different angles in the focal plane. So you cannot make the reverse function. The reverse is not a, a 
in mathematical terms, speaking a function anymore. But you can, if you change here the angle appropriately, you can make all these come to the same angle. Uh, so by changing here the angular dispersion, you can actually uh, get here the condition that you can take the angle here and reconstruct uh, the, uh, the focal plane here. So that is implemented in dispersion matching. Uh, I have here defined the, um, uh, the resolving power, uh, but that has already been very nicely explained in the Manuel's lecture yesterday. Um, it comes to the point that the resolving power is the dispersion over the magnification over 2x0 by the target, and that is the theoretical limit of the instrument. It can, of course, be deteriorated by poor beam, as I just uh, explained, or a higher orders, which may not be correct. So there's a difference between the resolving power, which is a capability, potential capability, and the real resolution. And you will see that uh, later. So uh, this slide I can uh, skip over. Manuel has already explained that. Oh, one more thing. Uh, of course, you see the resolving power has no meaning without giving uh, the size of the, uh, the object, uh, the, so the target spot, if you want. Uh, people often give a resolving power, don't say for which uh, uh, size x naught the refer this to. If it's not said anything, usually it's a millimeter taken, but uh, in strictly speaking, you always need to say resolving power for one millimeter target spot or something like that. Uh, and just uh, that you uh, are aware of that, if you want to go into the numbers, that is important. Dispersion matching. Now we are applying our knowledge of, um, of um, the um, transport matrix. We have here uh, and it would work for anything else. The IUCF beamline from the exit of the cyclotron, X naught, theta naught, delta naught. Uh, uh, there are many um, uh, beamlines or quadrupoles and drifts here up to the target of the K600 spectrometer. But as you know, if we are limit ourselves only to the horizontal plane, it's just one matrix with these six numbers here and here one. Okay. So, uh, by the same, uh, and I call that B, uh, reminding you that this is a beamline matrix. Uh, by the same uh, uh, token, you have from the target to the focal plane, uh, the matrix of the spectrometer, also just six numbers. So, magnification, focusing function, dispersion, and here's the angular dispersion. And of course, here, uh, the other uh, angular magnification, etc. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, you're not just sending the beam to the focal plane of the spectrometer, then you would just uh, multiply uh, B and uh, the S matrix, uh, but we have a target. So that target is kinematics, and you need to be aware of uh, the changes that are happening there. The changes are basically um, parameterized or explained here by three numbers. One is T, which is the aspect ratio uh, when you come in and come out and you look at an angle uh, from the target, and then of course the two rays here are different. That you can make always one by rotating the target uh, halfway towards the scattering angle of the spectrometer. Or if you're at zero degree, just perpendicular. So uh, let's think for our purposes that T is equal to one. C is a ratio. No, well, you know, I see here something blinding me, but you don't have it good. So C is the ratio of the momentum in and the momentum out. And so for elastic scattering or small Q values and large values, this is also, um, uh, say, let's say for now, close to one or one. K is the kinematic factor. So that is the, the usual kinematic factor that you have is uh, the change of the momentum with the scattering angle relative to the, uh, the total angle. So that is the kinematic figure. For, uh, for heavy targets, it is uh, close to zero, and at zero degree, it is for all purposes uh, zero. So 
this is now if you multiply that all together so your exit cyclotron matrix uh, uh, vector times the beam line uh, the target transformation uh, applied and then the spectrometer you get to the focal plane uh, focal plane uh, parameters here so all that done uh, by hand is a lot of work you can use Mathematica and you come to the following x in the focal plane depends of course on all the uh, parameters at the axis of the cyclotron plus an angle theta which is uh, the different scattering angles within the scattering of the uh, acceptance of the spectrometer and you have coefficients this coefficient here is unavoidable this co coefficient is uh, called kinematic defocusing this is called uh, dispersion matching and this is the uh, kinematic correction uh, this is simply that uh, your detector is in the focus uh, if uh, you have uh, for k equal to zero it's a one location but you know already from the impurity lines i showed you uh, the if the k is not zero the x theta emittance rotates so you can do that by shifting the detector or of course just changing the quadrupole if that is available so uh, let's consider that uh, not relevant for our discussion here because you always can do that so you have here these two terms which deteriorate your resolution if unless these coefficients are set to somehow to zero and that procedure is called dispersion matching then you get the best resolution and i will show you that you can actually get a factor of 10 better than the beams beam spread the same is for the angle and and this is uh, in the cartoon that i showed you before this is a situation where you have the dispersion of target made such uh, that in the the, the, for the different beam spread momenta, you have one place in the focal plane. The angular dispersion, which we also showed you in that cartoon, so that you can reconstruct the angle in the focal plane to the target, which is very important if you have, uh, if you can put a detector at the target, it's fine. But if you have one nano appear 10 to the nine particles, nobody can put a detector in there. So then you need this if you want to know the scattering angle. Uh, so, the, the, uh, for, from ion optics point of view, you can calculate, of course, all that. You know that by now. And you have here several terms. Uh, in particular, this term it can be set to zero. These terms are, uh, by luck, uh, you can study that for a particular uh, beam line and spectrometer. But they are small in, uh, in all the cases I have seen. But you see here, there's also there are these coefficients which are circled here are all beamline coefficients and you have the dispersion on target uh, sorry the focusing on target the dispersion on target the angular dispersion so you have three parameters and you can make them all to zero so this is this is shown here you have these two equations uh, you want to make to zero and you can solve them so if you have a uh, the, the beamline dispersion b126 b, b16 the angular dispersion and of course the focusing function uh, these terms if you make set these to these and this and this then you have full dispersion matching so you have the full resolution you can reconstruct your angle and if you think this is these are complicated yes but if you have a triplet in front of the target you can correct and design the beam line that you get the dispersion correct you can make this here all working nicely as i will show in a minute now as complicated as these are for k equal to zero so very heavy targets and close to zero degree uh, then it's just the dispersion is just dispersion over magnification and these we said for our discussion here they are one they may be slightly different than you have to uh, account for that angle dispersion also here k is equal to zero you need to focus on target b12 has to be zero if k is equal to zero t1 c1 there's some term here which 
you need to calculate. Okay, so now you know uh, what dispersion matching is. And if you look how this is done, um, before I came to correct this problem at the, uh, by the WS uh, beamline, the beamline went from here to here. And of course there was a dipole, but way not enough uh, for dispersion matching. So the resolution typically with this 10 to minus five instrument, which should give you 12 kV at 120 kV. After, uh, after we convinced uh, the uh, funding agency that we need a couple of million dollars to correct that, uh, this beamline was built. Uh, you see here the uh, K600 decommission is, was used, recycled. And uh, so with this, the first day, a couple of hours after uh, our commissioning, we had the resolution of uh, 12 kV. The problem is the instrument to get the high dispersion, disper uh, high resolving power, D over M or 2 x naught, has a very large dispersion of 17 meters. If you calculate B126, it's the dispersion over magnification of the spectrometer, and that it, it, the dispersion of time is to be 37 meter or 37 centimeter per percent. That you just it cannot get with a small dipole, but you need huge bands of dipole as done here. Now, this S shape not only provides this dispersion, but allows you to tune it chromatically and achromatically. That is for particular purposes, and you also want the achromatic beam. So this beamline uh, does that. And uh, you know now what achromatic means, and from my knowledge point of view, how this is uh, done, I will come back later in the next uh, lecture. So uh, this done, we can now, we have now dispersion matching, and it, it now back to the slide that I showed before, uh, with the trained eye now, you can see what this beamline is doing for you. It provides a dispersion so that this is a point and no more determined by the 120 kV for that particular case uh, spread of the beam. In addition, the angle here, you see the angle here for different momenta is such that they all coincide here, <coughs> coincide here, coincide here. So you have, can also reconstruct the, uh, the angle. In order to, initially we, were, we had all these formulas, people said, well, that doesn't work and so on. And uh, so we wanted to convince ourselves. So what we did, we took the K600 spectrometer, put a shift slit, so several slits here, in this case, uh, seven. And instead of taking a full target, we took a strip here, a strip here, spread it, and uh, set the dispersion to roughly what we wanted to uh, consider uh, dispersion match. And what we found, and you're now familiar with that after the discussion uh, earlier, this is x theta in the focal plane of the spectrometer. So here's the uh, theta projection, not of interest in this discussion, but uh, this, uh, this is, uh, the projection is resolution. So x, here are the counts, uh, here it's spread into angle. So what you see is uh, the blob in the center here, made actually a little bit larger so that we know where the center is. And then this doublet here comes from the two slits going through the center. This doublet from the next over slit. So you see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh one is not within the acceptance. And from the left to the right, you have a difference in energy. So you're not dispersion matched. When the dispersion, when we then adjusted our quadrupoles to get the dispersion uh, on target correct, it's dispersion matched. So now we, we uh, understood clearly where it comes from. We also had a diagnostics tool to say what we are dispersion matched. Because if you run a, a ionoptical code and you hope the setting will give you the, the optimum that you need, Good luck, that is not working. You just to understand there's a, there's a certain rift between what you calculate and the practical terms you have to live with. 
uh, and improve by including all the effects that you may need, but that may not be possible in practical terms. So, um, what is the diagnostics? We don't need seven slits here. We just need one slit, say one slit of a millimeter or two at the entrance of the spectrometer. We don't need here uh, two strips. Half a millimeter strips are very difficult to make. Uh, and then you don't see all these dots, but then you, you see all these dots, just the middle dot. And you don't see uh, these two from the strips, but you see a little elongated, tilted ellipse. So if you split that into three, then you can not only, and then you have a diagnostics tool from that, <laughs> that position uh, for optimizing the dispersion. And the width is the, is the um, focusing condition. So you have the diagnostic tools that you need. So with this, the spectrometer, which had uh, at, uh, here an example, PP prime, 300 MeV, always had 120 kV resolution uh, after this was implemented at uh, the Grand Ryden at 12 kV and at uh, 400 M, roughly 400 MeV, 17 kV, which was the limit of the resolving power of the instrument. So D over M over 2X naught for one millimeter, which we could make, uh, was giving that independently of how wide the beam spread is. The beam spread only makes uh, the, the spot on target because of the dispersion uh, larger or smaller. Uh, there is some, I have to look at the time. Uh, there is some exercise that you make to get uh, in vertical direction. You see here, we discussed that this is a, the focusing point and you have, we are under focus, uh, over focused or under focused. To measure the angle here is because of the large um, uh, or small, uh, large angle, what is it? Uh, the small angle divided by large angle, small angle dispersion, uh, angular uh, magnification, sorry. Uh, this is not a good measurement uh, of the angle at the target, although we can reconstruct it with calibration. Uh, so we use the vertical by defocusing, we use the vertical information and that gave much better results. Uh, that is shown here, I'm not going into details. All I want to say here, of course, in the focal plane, you have, a dis uh, you have uh, if you look at uh, theta focal plane and here y focal plane, uh, as I said, representative for the angle, uh, then you see here the uh, the higher order uh, orders in uh, in, wor in working. Uh, in the fo that's what you see in the focal plane. But since you know this came from the rectangular aperture, you can uh, calibrate and calculate your higher orders, and then get uh, then reconstruct uh, the uh, and calibrate it. Now this has very important uh, consequences. If you look here at the spectrum at zero degree. Uh, I already uh, mentioned uh, how zero degree is done. Uh, you see here uh, the reconstructed theta of the uh, phi of the target and theta of the target. So we are looking now not anymore uh, what is happening in the focal plane, but we are looking after calibrations and so on and dispersion matching, angular dispersion matching, what we call full dispersion matching. Uh, you can look here at the measurement uh, at the target. Now, this here is, uh, shows, so first of all, we see the acceptance of the spectrometer, plus minus one degree, plus minus a little bit more than two degrees in the case of the um, uh, Grand Ryden spectrometer. You also see here, when you plot all the targets, you see here the concentric rings of concentric uh, angles, zero degree, half a degree, one degree, 1.5, two degrees. And you see here an L equal to zero transition, which has peaked at zero degree. And if you look at uh, this year, uh, they are L equal to zero and larger than zero. So if we, if we calculate now, the, take the spectrum from zero to eight degrees, which is uh, everything that is within this circle, uh, 0.8 to 1.4 degrees, and uh, over 1.4 degrees, you see here, for instance, this peak, this peak is peaked at zero degree. This peak is small at zero degree. If you go, this peak increases, increases, and this decreases. So this is an L equal to zero, 
And this is larger than L, one or two, I don't remember. So this all works very well and uh, so on. So this is a first order ion optical uh, problem that we have uh, solved here by multiplying matrices and doing some experiments. This here is, in, in practical terms, you see here the energy and the angle, and this is how dispersion matching works. If you have to, the last quadrupoles in front of the target, you have to adjust to get the smallest possible, uh, uh, possible spot here. This looks like an ellipse, and you, you, last night I suddenly thought, oh, how is the emittance change? <laughs> We have only conservative forces. Well, the problem is this is energy and this is the angle. So these are uh, not, uh, um, this is not a uh, phase space. The phase space on the x, theta, y, phi, energy, time. <coughs> they, they have to be uh, these, um, I forgot how they're called, uh, commutable. Uh, parameters. Okay, so uh, diagnostics. I'm not saying much about diagnostics. I just want to make you aware that you, if you want to check your ion optics, you need diagnostics. The diagnostics is uh, difficult to design. They are, in particular, if you come large particles, but we have come a long way. You have now detectors which can measure 10 to the 6. So for radioactive beams, you may actually be able to measure the beam without destroying your detectors. When this slide was done, that wasn't possible. And of course, if you're beyond the 10 to the 6, even with radioactive beam where you hope to get with this new EFRA facility, then you also cannot do uh, measurements within the beam line and uh, measure your parameters. So you will see there are a lot of uh, diagnostics elements. Also, that de detectors are more or less diagnostic elements but for an analysis problem. At, uh, at SICAR, there are many uh, elements. Sara and uh, Fernando, they are implementing them. Uh, other people are designing them. So uh, just to be aware uh, of uh, diagnostic elements are important. Uh, they uh, help you to set up a beamline after you have calculated that within ion optics. Uh, we need to measure the field. We do that with uh, several devices. One of the nicest devices is a Hall probe. It's just a small millimeter by millimeter chip. Uh, you may be familiar with it uh, already from uh, your undergraduate studies. If you run a current from here to here and a field here, uh, then you can induce a potential across here. You can measure that potential uh, here, U, and it's proportional to B, of course, I, but that is of the order of, uh, depends on the, uh, the whole group you have, say, 100 milliampere or something like this. And you, uh, with a constant that you have to determine, you can measure the field. It's very nice because it works uh, under all circumstances, even if the field in a quadrupole, where the field changes, uh, it just integrates and over that one millimeter. It's usually good enough. And they are, if they are, Precision is down to about 10 to minus 4. Their energy, their temperature calibrated and so on. We will have them in SICA. So you will hear a lot about the whole probes. A much more precise measurement is, of course, use uh, the uh, uh, Larmor frequency uh, rotation of a, a, a particle with a spin, uh, like a proton in a water probe. Uh, you're probably familiar with that. You can get 10 to minus 5 precision. The problem is it's so precise that if the field is not constant within the couple of millimeters of your uh, probe <coughs> that you are uh, having there, uh, you don't have any measurement. Uh, so uh, in a quadrupole, you cannot use actually uh, dipole, uh, 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 NMR probe. You need already a good dipole field. So for dipole field, not in the French region, uh, this is a high precision measurement independent of temperature and so on, very nice. So NMR, uh, all, NMR probes and all probes are devices. <coughs> there are other ways, there are other ways to measure the, uh, like for instance in the, in the map, map, map uh, field measurement of the uh, field in the dipole of the S800, which is well documented. You have here a, a small probe, which is run here on a radial arm 
on uh, radia here. So if you are outside, uh, then you have, of course, no current in the, in the probe. Uh, but if you run it into the field, a changing field makes a current uh, in the coil. You can measure that current here. It goes up. And then when you're in the constant field, it goes uh, down again. Constant field in the dipole. At the exit, the same thing. If you integrate from here to here, you'll get this curve, which is along the radial path here, the field. You have here the nice dipole in the middle. And here you have the, the fringe field. Uh, just as an example, here only the fields at the point 0.28 Tesla, uh, this is a map, only everything about, uh, uh, above 99% is shown here. So this is a nice constant field everywhere at 0.27. If you go to 1.6 Tesla, saturation starts in. Uh, the, the, uh, you can see that here, the difference between lines is here, five Gauss. So you have here a field dropping very quickly, so fringe field and also radial dependence is there. Uh, so if you assume in the ion optics calculation uh, a constant field here, uh, that isn't going to work. So you need the higher order corrections either if you have devices, otherwise by uh, software, if that's possible. Okay, so this is uh, the end of my lecture two. And uh, I think we're ready for questions and discussion. We should probably form groups for discussion. So again, maybe first of all, just simple questions for okay. the lecture. Is uh, we have questions from? I went at a path, a quick through the material, so it may be a little bit overwhelming, but at least I wanted to give you a, a first impression how important the ion optics is and what you can do with this and uh, some of the consequences in uh, for practical devices. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the saturation uh, in the magnetic field. Yes. Is this uh, calculated in COSI if you have the higher orders? If you have the too high magnetic field? Because yes. So they, yes. they assume always iron, then, I guess. And yeah, if you, uh, the field calculation is of course not ion optics. It uh, is a, how to calculate the field with Maxwell's equation using a combination of coils and iron. So those are calculations which you can do with uh, Opera, which is a finite element field calculation. And all, here they're using more and more Maxwell. So those are, uh, those are programs that can calculate saturation. So you can, uh, to with limits of uh, precision, you can, uh, before you map the field, you can calculate it and design it for your optimum. And of course, you have the limitation saturation you cannot avoid. That's a material property of the iron. Uh, but you may be able to, for instance, you don't want to make sharp edges because the field lines crowd there and they repel each other. And so they make saturation effects in, in small corners locally. So you want all rounded edges and so on. But of course, there's a limit. If you go to 2.1 Tesla, there's saturation in the bulk of the material, not in small edges. So yeah, you can calculate. And uh, that is being done for the design of magnets. That is a, for, uh, we have done preliminary calculation for SECAR. We have done preliminary calculations so that we knew we are not specifying a system where the manufacturer says, oh, nobody can build that. There's not enough space. So that type we did, but the ultimate calculation 3D and the optimization finance, actually with the manufacturer in this case, uh, done physically. But we have the capability, but not the we didn't have the manpower. Okay, does that answer you? Um, so if you had a, like a mass spectrometer with a beam which is like under one keV, um, it's focused by plates with slits. Yes. Right. So are the quadrupoles just like a higher energy equivalent to those plates? Are the quadrupoles? Just like a like the equivalent at a higher energy to focus that being. Uh what what 
Mm, I'm not sure I so understand I'm, that question. So I'm I'm equivalent. Uh, I mean, you can you can calculate you can use this code for lower energies. That is correct, but then you still have a quarter pole. At what point would you stop using just like plates with a slit in it? Oh, and then you go to like a quarter pole, uh, quarter pole like a watt energy. I think we need to pick up that discussion uh, after the section and, and not really understand what <coughs> you're trying to solve there. We may have a problem I'm not familiar with, but uh, maybe we talk about that after the later. No more questions? Yeah. One more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How does the Lachinal properties of the projectile beam affects the resolving power on, on the resolution of the signal you can measure. I mean the bunch length and the energy spread in the bunch of projectile beam. Yes. Okay. So um, now you're probably referring to the dispersion map situation. The beam affects, of course, significantly just by the cartoon. You see that already. If you tune your beam achromatically, no matter what the beam is, on target, and then you, and that is larger than the resolving power of the spectrometer, you're limited by that momentum spread of the cyclotron. The, uh, during the time when there were only tendons and spectrometers, the spectrometers were not yet the highest res resolving power, and the beam of a tandem is very narrow at low energies, that issue didn't appear. But when the cyclotrons came with the uh, resolution typically more than 10 times worse, but of course higher energies and tendons can do uh, 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 static accelerators. Then you had a problem. So then Henry in uh, 74 recognized the D over M over uh, dispersion, not yet the angular dispersion, but uh, they, that could be solved. So first order, it of course affects. And the solution is dispersion matching, as I hope I've uh, show you. So the, the uh, high resolution spectrometer under the condition where the momentum spread is larger than the resolving power of the instrument, colloquially speaking, uh, you need the beamline has to be included. The dispersion has to be, and the angular dispersion has to be made correctly to get most uh, capabilities of the spectrometers uh, working for you. So it is, yes, and, 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 and yeah, of course, the beam, the beam properly spread. One other consequence is uh, if you uh, have a uh, um, um, cyclotron with 100 keV, you have a beam sp dispersion 37 meter. So that is even if you have a, a centimeter per percent. So the 37 centimeter per percent. So you have a centimeter a percent spread of the beam, your target is 37 centimeter. That is uh, not the case at a uh, good cyclotron like the ring cyclotron, but for secondary RI beam, it is. Because they are a, a percent momentum spread, you, you will try to get as many as possible, and unless you work with RIA-3, which is a rear accelerated beam, which has a small emittance, you will probably have a very broad uh, spectrum. So the, the target uh, from a secondary beam, the spread on the target for high resolution may actually be a meter. So you cannot build a, a detector anymore. So it all, the beam line, the beam properties, and the spectrometer, they all have to be uh, adjusted to each other, all considered for particular purposes. I think Fernando. Can we go to slide number 14? Are you confused by the dispersion matching for the, the target effect? Because here, for the C, the C and K, you select an angle. But like for example, in SECA, you have a reaction. Yes. You can have different angles and different energies. So you really only match for a given angle. Well, the. Uh... The kinematics is uh, given within the K and the C. 
the uh, the angle the angle is in this angle theta and that is the opening of the if you want the opening angle of the spectrometer the c t t t okay uh, so t is if you go uh, if you have uh, you have here the central ray and you have a ray which is uh, at uh, parallel but at a different at a different um, uh, distance, sorry, and you hit the target, and now here you spec here is your spectrometer. Uh, these are no more x1 apart, the distance, but uh, depending on the angle, and that angle is calculated. Uh, that angle is uh, well, <coughs> not that angle. The t is uh, the, the t is here. So you, you can solve that if if you make. The uh, the t uh, phi target he called here the uh, half of the uh, of the angle uh, you make that uh, um, this is always one if uh, the target uh, th this angle here if that is half of this angle then you get this is always one because. Uh, Cosine from zero is one. So you come with the beam, and in order to come at the same distance, you need to rotate your target. Uh, this is like uh, take two two posts, one uh, uh, telegraph post here, one here. If you look from this angle here, they are separated by a certain distance. If you look from another direction, they have a different distance. Uh, but if you if you look from here with the same angle as you look from here, then they look at the same distance. That is basically what this function does. So that can be always uh, uh, calibrated. Of course, for zero, it is always uh, already, uh, and you just go straight through. But the angle of the spectrometer is important at the angle of the target, and you can make it t by putting the angle of the target relative to the spectrometer at the same angle. That is a T. Okay. Any other questions directly for what we had here? Okay. <clears throat> um, using cost, what we have done so far is to, for example, we put into a standard apple, a standard quarter, and we define the field and after so on. Um, but my question is. In this uh, lecture, you introduced some, for example, this hexagon um, <coughs> uh, on top of a quad quadruple. So my question is: Is this also possible to be calculated in Cauchy, or even uh, is Cauchy possible to calculate arbitrary um, field? The yes. Well, Cauchy has, of course, a, a preset. A preset of uh, uh, situations that you will face in in, uh, in devices. So there is not only the quadrupole, which would be the MQ or MH quadrupole, hexapole, octopole, but there's a multipole. M5 uh, gives the radius, and then you give five numbers, and these five numbers are the quadrupole component, the hexapole component, and so on. Uh, by the same thing, if you look at the uh, the dipole. Uh, command. Uh, you can also make them uh, put in the multipole in the edge, so you know they're already from the from the focusing edge. But there can be uh, that is a there's a polynomial behind it, so you can have hexapole and octopole also in the edges. There's also a, a, a command, uh, and you can do that the the radial function. You've seen from the saturation of the S800, it saturates heavily at 1.6. So in radial direction, not the edges of the, of the ex entrance and exit, but if you go, say, through the center of the radial function, it's also not a constant, but it changes with excitation that I've shown slightly, but even possibly if you go to the high end center, uh, dramatically. So that radial dependence can also be put in. There's also a way, but that is then for the advanced uh, people, I've never done that. You can also put empirically so you, if you have measured, or for that matter, calculated with opera or fee, the field, 
and it saturates, has very odd shape, very funny. You can just enter this data and uh, Cosi will calculate for that. But that is not in the standard uh, book anymore. <laughs> and it's, the field is, I call it, not parameter, parameterized, but it's an empirical field. So for that, you, yes, actually, actually measured field shape. Uh, okay. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then let's uh, form the groups for discussion.